Mr. Mike, Hello. long time no see. Yeah, how's it going? So yeah. what's what's in the case? Uh, listings. That's a lot of listings. It's show and tell. It's show and tell day here. <laughs> Everybody brings their own missile computer, their Apollo cases. <laughs> If you follow the channel, you might remember RR Auction, the auction house that had us authenticate an Apollo Guidance computer they recently had on sale. It turns out it was the sister of the one we just had restored. We actually tried to bid on it, but pricing went stratospheric, or should I say orbital. And we watched it disappear into oblivion along with its unknown new owner. But all was not lost, as we appeased our sorrow by bidding on other items, and each of us got a few. Marcel got many items that we'll have to go over one of these days, including the space shuttle computer. I got the Palasite meteorite and the Soviet clock, which we have already restored and you have seen in other videos. Mike likes to acquire original documentation that helps him fill the few remaining gaps in his immense knowledge but probably his most noble save were a couple of the original Apollo source code listings. These were listings owned by Don Isles, one of the original programmers, and that Mike had spent years working on, scanning, recompiling, and eventually running the code on a repaired machine. The uh, flown Apollo 12 software. And that, that came also out of Don Isles' collection? Yes, yeah, this is his copy. Hold on a second, I need to zoom out, it doesn't fit in my <laughs> picture. Yeah, all right. So it's about six and a half inches of software. Without bugs. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we can't do that anymore. Oh. And with no high level language. Oh, in Got their interpreter, which is... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, a little bit, uh, well, yeah. Still, it's mostly assembly stuff. Don uh, printed it out, or? Um, I think, yeah. Um, th this was uh, written on by the mainframe guys, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. 238C was Don's office number. Okay, all right. Um, so, so that's printed for Don Isles. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then up in the header here, uh, GAP is the name of the assembler, the General Assembly Program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's revision 116 of AGC Program Luminary uh, by NASA. This is the drawing number. Uh, it was printed at 7.09 p.m. on August 11th, 1969, uh, right. which is the day before uh, this program was released to Raytheon to manufacture the rope modules. Okay. Um, so it was, you know, known that oh, this is going to be our release program. So that's so very shortly so. after the landing, they already have the fix for twelve oh two. I didn't take them very long, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I went in. Yeah, pretty sh pretty shortly after. Actually, this one uh, have we recompiled this one? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually went through all of it mm -hmm. and make sure we we scanned it and OCR'd it with, yep. without errors. And we ran. You know the the version of this that we uh, we digitized on the AGC mm -hmm. when we had it. I think I ran all of our software. Okay. On it. And can you uh, explain? You know, take a line and explain the general meaning of the numbers. Let me find something that would work well here. Okay. Yeah, this will work. So assembly listing. Yeah. I see the the instructions over here. Yep. So you've got the instructions and the addresses for those instructions. Okay. Uh, everything from here to the right is uh, comments. So instru instruction or parent. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So so this is the uh, assembled version of the instruction. So one six zero six four is what TCF Danzig assembles to. And then the one there is the parity bit for that word. Why is there a one and then a blank and 6064? Uh, they split it up uh, printing wise. So one in this case is the three bit opcode and then 6064 is the address of Danzig. But but in the in, in memory it's all mushed together. Right, yeah. And then different different lines are printed differently. Like right. the one up here is five zero one six six. So uh -huh. this this instruction index. Uh-huh. 
um, is, is being treated as a quarter code. Uh-huh. Um, this one, the, the apostrophe there, means that a couple of the bits uh, <laughs> of one contribute to the instruction, but not all of them. Oh, okay. So, so the, the, the split instruction operand. Yeah, because you know the AGC has a variable number of bits that go into determining okay. what the instruction All right. is. Okay. So I so now well I've learned something because I always <laughs> wonder what that little yep that little apostrophe was. Uh, this is the address column. Uh huh. So our our TCF Danzig is in bank zero at address three two seven one. Okay, and is this all we forgot to say? Is this all octal? There's yes. no numbers higher than seven. Uh, for these columns, yeah. For this column. Uh, everything to the left of here is decimal. All right. So see that. So the bank is the bank of the of the fixed uh, memory of the rope. Memory. Of the rope. Yeah. Right. The AGC didn't have the luxury of miniature disk drives, nor even ROM, which were still to be invented in the future. So instead, the programs were stored on these modules of core rope fixed memory. They plug at the back of the machine, and you can fit six of them. Inside, they contain core rope a special type of permanent core memory where the bits are literally woven in and cannot be changed. An address 3271. Okay. How many banks again in rope memory? Uh, there are 36 banks. Quite, quite a few, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Goes from zero and to 43. And six, six banks per module. Yep. And six module. Okay, I remember that now that you say it. And then <laughs> 2,000 octal words mm -hmm. per bank. Okay. Whatever that comes out to be, decimal. 2,000 octal work, but it goes further than 2,000. Yeah, it starts at address 2,000 and goes to 4,000, which is the beginning of fixed fixed memory. So, so there is no 0 to 2,000 because that would be regular memory? Or? 0 to 2,000 is all erasable. It's erasable, okay. All right, so it makes sense. So if you address, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, skipping over these columns, this on the far left side uh -huh. is the punch card number. Uh, so these are all ah. in sequence. Um, every punch card had a unique ID punched into it so that uh, if you dropped your punch card deck, you could sort them <laughs> at the machine easily. Let's not forget that terminals did not exist, or at least were not common at the time. So the source code input came via a deck of punch cards like this little Fortran program we ran in another episode. Fortunately, the cards were then copied to magnetic tapes and further cards were only needed to make edits to the source code that was already on tape. We tried to see if we could... We were restoring the, the punch on the 1401, it wasn't working that well. So okay, well... What about we punch the, well, you came up with that, punching the whole thing. <laughs> and it's whatever, 23,000 cards? That's with a block one. Uh, that's with Apollo 4 and 6 flight software uh, is, yeah, 20 something thousand cards. Oh, that's a smaller one. That's, yeah, it's less than half the size of this. All right, yeah, and, then, so. and then we went, oh, okay, <laughs> we have 20,000 cards in, no, we have to buy them. And there's a guy that makes it, how much is it? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. It's 70, so it's, it's a, I can't remember, it's a, you yep. know, this is several hundred boxes, 200 boxes right. of cards, and it's $70 a card, and we say, no, no. <laughs> and even, <laughs> it is also, they put a lot more comments, like full mm -hmm. line ex mm -hmm. explanatory comments mm -hmm. into this later software, and it takes potentially two cards to, to hold a comment. Oh, that's it's, true. It's 120 columns across, but the punch cards are only 80 columns. Yes. So there's a special type of... Um, on the, on the punch card, you can specify a vertical spacing. So when you see a break between two lines, they uh -huh. punched a vertical spacing into that card. So 1973 has a two in its vertical spacing column to give it an extra space after, uh, before 1974 here. Um, if you put a nine... And that's, that's just to ease the, the printout, to make it more readable. Yep. It's a paragraph right. mark. Yeah. Uh, if you put an eight into that column, it's a page break. Um, it's a what? A page break? So they would have oh, had... page break. Yeah. Because this page doesn't start with a P card, um, 1941 here, this is a short page, uh, punch card 1941 up here would have had an 8 in its vertical spacing column, which oh, caused it to go to the next page. so it's not the computer that prints smartly. It's, it's the assembler that, that is being smart about it. Oh. Um, and then a 9 in that column will let you put uh, characters in columns uh, 81 through 120 mm -hmm. for comment lines. So all of this stuff over here got put there by uh, right-aligned remarks cards, is what they called them. 
Uh huh. And then there, there would be an extra card punched. Yep. Which has that stuff coming afterwards. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay. Cool. So and then, here are in that middle column here. These oh are yeah, the addresses. These the, are the, the labels. The labels. Yeah. You point at it again. Yeah. These are the labels. T push RBQ. Right. So the jump points, the address. Yep. Jump points. So if we look uh, up here, mm -hmm. there's a, a transfer control fixed to T push, which mm -hmm. is sending us to address three two seven two. And if we look at T push, there it is at in bank zero at address three two seven two. All right. Uh, so these columns are interesting. Uh, this is how programmers navigated the listings. Hmm. Uh, for every line, uh, when you refer to a symbol in the address column, mm -hmm. uh, you get a reference printout over here. So uh, let's look at um, uh, let's look at um, the fixed lock here. Mm -hmm. So fixed lock, um, this says this is reference 50 mm -hmm. of fixed lock. So before in the listing, fixed lock has been referred to uh, 49 times before this one. The last reference to fixed lock was on page 1067. Uh, so if we go back to page 1067. I see it. Here we go. Here's reference 49 to fixed lock. Oh, wow. That's a feature that has disappeared from <laughs> <laughs> today's uh, assembler. It's very, it's very, yeah. it's very handy. Yeah. Uh, so in the in the very back of the listing, if we go all the way back here, um, there is a a symbol table. Let's actually find fixed lock up here. Uh, so the assembler was working pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. They they made it as easy to <laughs> navigate a giant piece of mm -hmm. uh, paper as they could. Uh, fix lock. Here we go. So the symbol table gives you a list of all the symbols. Um, it gives you what they're defined as. So fix lock mm -hmm. is defined as zero one two zero. It's mm -hmm. a location in erasable memory. Mm -hmm. So fix lock was was referenced a total of ninety six times. Mm -hmm. You've got the first page. Um, I'm not sure what the middle column is, and then you've got the last page. Mm -hmm. mm. So, yeah. so you can go back fairly easily in this huge, huge amount of software. It's just remarkable. <laughs> <sighs> and somebody had to punch in the twenty thousand cards. Yeah, it, it evolved over time. No, yeah, they. they the um, well, the assembler it, stored on tape all of the punch cards. So mm -hmm. once you had the program in there, it mm -hmm. was you only had to put in which cards you were changing or right, added. right, right. You were editing, mm -hmm. and, and then then you had to reprint the whole thing. They would consume right. lots of paper. Yep. And then so they did. No, th this this was this never existed in punch cards. This is just a, an output. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Everything from. So the the actual programming is. So we, you, you, you know exactly how many lines a program is, then, if you look at the number of the last punch card? Nope. Nope. Uh, the punch card number restarts uh, with every log section. Uh -huh. uh, so, <laughs> and also, they, you know, if they deleted cards, uh -huh. um, they... Um, oh, the punch card numbers can be non-consecutive? Yes, they can be non-consecutive. Also, normally they're four digits, uh -huh. uh, but there's implied zeros. So here, they inserted code. Okay, but they on. didn't have to renumber everything. So they, they wanted to add uh, code between punch cards 125 and 126. Uh -huh. uh, and to do that, they C2, used these... C1, C2, C3, C4, okay. No, 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 that's a zero. Um, okay. So oh. there's there's implied zeros after all of these uh, ah. punch cards. The assembler treats spaces as zeros in those columns. Okay, oh, smart. Yeah, so <laughs> you can put uh, code between two consecutive punch cards what were you pointing at? I was pointing at uh, the the printer totally beefed it here. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh so so nobody knows what the code is or you figured it out. It's this is completely identical to other luminaries. They didn't change the comments there. Okay, so um, you were able to yeah. recover it from but then that. We get onto a different type of paper before the um so this is like between two different uh Oh, something happened. Yep. <laughs> and they say, oops, the paper. <laughs> yep. Paper got stuck and then they restart with another paper. <laughs> uh, and then if we get to the the landing code here. P63? 
this particular copy of um, of Luminary 116 was used in the development of the Apollo 13 code, and so like it has pieces of code that have been scratched out that they changed for Apollo 13. Mm. Um, there's a lot of um, that there's an instruction that got crossed off. Uh, lots of uh, annotations in the, the landing section as Don was figuring out what changes to make for Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. What well, hasn't gone so well? And you think that they didn't like that happening in Apollo 12? That the um, note? So, uh, yes, uh, Apollo 12. I want to say they had a hard time judging their rate of descent visually because mm -hmm. of all the dust that was being kicked mm -hmm. up. Um, so they made they made um, changes to P sixty six for Apollo thirteen. Mm -hmm. They added the auto P sixty six mode that wasn't present in Apollo twelve or earlier. Auto P sixty six meaning it jumped from sixty four to sixty six automatically, or no? Um, so. Auto P66 is an uh, automatic hold on uh, horizontal velocity. On 11, you had to manually control your attitude during that. Yes. On, on 12, you just say, okay, I want to z null out completely my horizontal velocities, and it automatically does that. Oh, okay. So, well, that would be good for me because I have trouble with that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> So when we landed with the AGC, we used the Apollo 11 software. In P66, the computer still helps you greatly, but you have to control your rate of descent while changing your attitude to null your horizontal velocity. Mike makes it look easy, but believe me, it's certainly not, even without the 1202 errors nagging you and not fearing for your life. So attitude holds. P66, you got it. So now you're flying. Now I'm flying. So I'm controlling uh, the attitude with the stick, which controls the horizontal velocity. Uh -huh. And I'm controlling the rate of descent with the uh, ROD switches, the rate of uh -huh. descent switches. You have become really good at it <laughs> after <laughs> crashing a few times. <laughs> Just a few times. So Mike was saying that they added the capability for the computer to automatically control the attitude to null the horizontal velocities from the Doppler radar, even without good visibility on the surface. The astronaut would still be responsible for the rate of descent. Contact light. Contact light. Okay, so press the button to uh, stop the engine. Uh, take the ACA out of detent. Descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. And then we're on the surface. Uh, let's see, the, the one other fun thing in here is we can find the fix that they put in for uh, the Apollo 11 program alarms. It should be somewhere around here. Oh, they, they, should, they should have zeroed the CDU somewhere. Here it is. The fix. The fix for the 1202. <laughs> this chunk. All right. With a nice comment to go along with it. Okay, program alarm. Looking good to us, over. It's 1202. 1202. I suppose you are all familiar with the 1202 error, but to make a very long and convoluted story short, the coupling data unit, or CDU, failed. The circuit that failed was the analog to digital converter that reported the angular position of the rendezvous radar to the computer. The CDU kept the digitized radar position in a counter and kept changing it even though the radar was not moving a bit, which in turn continuously interrupted the AGC for updates even though it was not even using the data. Needless to say, this had to be fixed for Apollo 12. A hardware fix would have necessitated a complete system re-engineering, but the software fix as you will see, was just a few lines. It's just no kind of mute the thing if it gives you stupid <laughs> air, stupid stuff. If select switch is not in LGC, send RRCDU zero bit to prevent memory cycle snatching by manic RRCDUs. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, 
So that is, <laughs> we, we have to make, we still have to make the whole episode of 1202 because it's mm -hmm. so crazy, but we have so much hardware to build it, yep. to reproduce. The fault is so immensely complicated. And none of the original documentation and got it right. <laughs> none of it is explained correctly, but <laughs> the solution is just to ignore what the, the CDU tells you, basically ignore the readings uh, from the coupling data unit, which is basically the A to D. So here's the bad boy that nearly crashed Apollo 11, the CDU located beneath the AGC in the LEM. It's roughly the same size as the AGC, a little bigger actually, uh, looks similar and is very complicated. Inside it uses a modular construction similar to the AGC and being a very high precision 5 channel fast A to D converter has both analog and digital electronics. So here is how to read the scripted comment. If select switch is not in the LGC, this refers to the rendezvous radar mode select switch, which selects which units control the pointing of the radar. It has three positions, auto track, where the radar keeps pointed on its own once it's locked on the signal, slew, where the astronauts point it manually and was the setting used during the landing, basically stationary, and LGC, which is the nickname of the AGC in the LEM, where the computer points it to where it thinks the command module is. So the first line just means, in that switch position, the computer is not pointing the radar and therefore can safely ignore the position data sent by the CDU. The big problem is that it was physically impossible for the computer to ignore the CDU. The CDU counter was directly wired to a specific hardware increment instruction in the AGC and would steal an instruction cycle every time it was updated. In other words, the CDU hardware had priority over the software no matter what. The next bit in the comment, send RRCDU 0 bit, is the miracle fix to this problem. There was a hardware line from the computer to the CDU attached to that bit that would reset the counter in the CDU. And that was just to be used for a reset. But if that bit is continually set, the hardware counter would forever be locked to zero. So the computer could fight back <laughs> at the CDU and lock it via hardware too. So now you can understand what prevent cycle snatching means. Now that the CDU counter is locked to zero, it will not trigger the unstoppable increment instruction and steal a cycle from the LGC. And the last bit is the kicker, by manic RR CDUs. So RR is the nickname for the rendezvous radar. And actually, if the CDU had behaved and hadn't become manic, nothing bad would have happened at all, since the radar actually wasn't moving at all. So what happened is that the unit circle here in the CDU failed in a very bizarre and complicated way. It was due in part to a system configuration problem, where it was getting reference signals from two out-of-phase supplies, but also a lot more. Nevertheless, the CDU falsely reported a high rate of radar movement and stole cycles at almost the highest possible rate it was designed for. So yes, it really became manic but now the counter would be held in reset at zero, and although the CDU would become manic again for every one of the other Apollos, it would be prevented from wrecking havoc by the software hack. Basically, when the switch is not in our mode, ignore it, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, which, it, which, should, which the hardware should have done, they shouldn't have had to fix it in software. How many was uh, punch card was it fixed? Seven. One, yep, up to seven. 11, oh, 81 to 11. 87. Okay, seven punch cards. Or eight, I guess. It looks like they changed. Fix the 1202. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're right. Well, that's, that was a good fix. Um, this page is called Subroutine Calls. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. it's a list of subrow uh, pseudo instructions mm -hmm. that inst instantiate. Um, subroutines which are, are like individually assemblable chunks of the program mm -hmm. so like lumerase is all the erasables lemonade is like startup stuff uh lamp p20s is all the p20 mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth uh kissing 
<laughs> kissing is uh, for when the command module and lunar module are docked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called smooch on the in the command module listing. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, each of those have a revision as well. Um, for this particular listing, you didn't have to specify so a revision, the, but this the, is that's the library of subroutines basically that right. this was supposed to be assembled with right. or linked yeah. to. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So you could specify, okay, give me revision 128 mm. of Lumerace, mm -hmm. and then you know putting together a bunch of different revisions mm -hmm. of. Subroutines gives you your whole listing. So that's, that's um, something that I didn't talk about link. is um, this this asterisk that shows up right after the punch card number. Yeah. Uh, this asterisk means that this punch card has been changed since the last revision. So this this particular punch card here is the difference between Luminary one uh, one sixteen and one fifteen, uh -huh. and that was to rev uh, the fly subroutine. Uh huh. Uh, so something in fly changed between luminary 115 and 116, and if we would go to fly and look for asterisks there, we could figure out exactly what that was. Ah, so the, it's remarkably terse but complete. Mm -hmm. right. Very nice. Well, when you don't have many bits, you use them wisely. <laughs> or when you have <laughs> Mostly the contrary, when you have too many bits, <laughs> you use them very badly. <laughs> What's happening today? Yep. Let's see if I want to. <laughs> we should weigh it. Yeah, how much software used to weigh? <laughs>